my pleasure to introduce you to Humberto Debat, who's going to talk us through his talk. I'll just hand straight over to you. We'll do 15 minutes, and Humberto has said we're leaving some time for questions, so we'll do that when that happens. This talk is in English, right? Yeah. Correct. Go for it. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, these are going to be my slides. It's, it's not very easy to connect these dots, but I'll try to give you an essence about virus discovery using publicly available data. Uh, the first slides are going to be a little about viruses, what are they, and how do we, how much there are of them, and how we classify them. And all the latest slides are going to be about the examples of that. So if I get uh, uh, into a lengthy presentation, I can cut any time uh, and my time goes down because there are just going to be examples. So, well, the first one is about uh, uh, are virus alive because you know I wanted to talk about a little bit about what viruses are. It's a, it's like they, they are really living organism, but they have like the lots of functions of, 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 of organisms. Uh, they replicate that they, would, they share that with with, uh, with a cellular living organism, but their structure is so simplistic, complex and, and fantastic. They are just uh, from a biochemistry point of view, they are just nucleic acids surrounded by proteins and lipids, and they can do all their functions only with that. And how do they do that? By parasitizing essentially all of their functions in their host. So they take the host machinery, they use it to make more copies of them, and they expand, and they diversify, evolve, etc. So they have a lot of properties of living things. For instance, the first one is the capacity to evolve, uh, but they cannot uh, live by themselves, so they are uh, an obligate parasite. Um, well, but about them, uh, how do we recognize them? Well, they're like, they come in different shapes and, and forms. For instance, you can see here, like that big one. They, this one are a few that are f of importance uh, for humans. For instance, the, the big one is uh, on the left here is uh, the Ebola virus. Uh, but uh, you can see uh, some with different structure, like this one is the rabies, or, or here there's a small one that you have to take care about when you are here in Buenos Aires today because we're having an outbreak of dengue virus. You should use a mosquito repellent when you go a little outside because we have a lot of cases of that, a lot more than, you know, the SARS. This is the structure of the typical structure of the coronavirus that is ha during the pandemic that has been a very important impact in, in, in our lives. So, so how do we know how these viruses have these forms? Well, traditionally, we used uh, some uh, things called electron microscopy to see them, in, like in, in, in 2D presentations. And, and you have here this. This is one of the first photos of a, of a coronavirus. is from the 60s with an electron micrograph made by John Almey. Uh, who was a Scottish uh, lab employee who made one of these uh, the first virus discoveries. So now we talk about coronavirus uh, thanks of, of, of this uh, scientist who discovered this structure. So that was uh, some form to classify them. But uh, as you can see, uh, for instance, the SARS-CoV-2 has this uh, same structure and the, the SARS that made this epidemic in the 2002. So regardless of their structure, there can be very a lot of difference between viruses even sharing that structure. So there are other ways to classify them. We're going to speak about classifying, but firstly, what about how much of viruses are there? Well, this is the 75 million blue whales uh, analogy. Um, uh, th that would be the biomass of all the estimated uh, particles uh, around the world of viruses that are at any moment. And, and uh, for instance, in terms of, of size, even they are so small, if you put them end to end, all the virus particles that we have today in the Earth, it will span around, around 65 million uh, galaxies uh, in size. So even though they are small, they are the most prevalent uh, uh, biological entity in the world, um, we, which has been a lot of the time ignored, uh, and, and you're going to see about that. And here, for instance, you have like here the blue whale, but if you go to Chubut in, the, in, in Argentina to see whales, you're going to see this one, which is a, the southern right whale. So again, uh, organisms with similar structure that are uh, uh, biologically di very different. So you need better ways to classify them uh, uh, that has to do a lot more with other stuff than morphology. And there's what it comes about genomics and, uh, and, and generated data to, uh, to try to classify based in the, that primary information which is in the nucleic acids. But first of all, 
uh, I say there are a lot of viral particles. What about species when we classify them? Well, for instance, in, in the world there are around uh, a little over 5,000 uh, species of, of mammals, and every year they, they, they identify a new species, or maybe two or a handful at least of species. But that number grows not very uh, rapidly. In the case of viruses, uh, as of today, there are only, only 11,000 species that have been formally classified, recognized by an organism which is called International Committee of Virus Taxonomy, that is the one that says this is a species, this is another species. Because, as I say, they are maybe not alive, but they have biological entities, so we can classify it as a biological uh, uh, replicator, at least. Uh, so, uh, but the estimations of the, this, na uh, this number doesn't represent at all the diversity of viruses there is. Some, uh, some ballpark estimation, and you'll see the range because of how very little we have. We are 10 minutes already? Or I have 10 left? <laughs> ah, oh, I see. Oh. That's great. <laughs> so uh, uh, you, you'll see this interval to, to take a, a, a glimpse of, of what we know and what we don't know. Uh, the estimate talk about 10 to the seventh or 10 to the nine distinct virus species. That I'm not good at numbers, but I think this is like 10 million and this is like 1 billion. So, uh, and, and I told you that there are currently only this uh, number uh, already classified. So uh, that's one of the great perks of being a virus discovery scientist because every day we're looking to things that nobody knew they existed. So every day is like a new uh, discovery, something new because almost everything is unknown. Even we, in the recent years, we have a lot of uh, effort to try to uh, understand the diversity of virus. Classifications lacks very well behind, even though we, know, we now know, uh, we, we, are, we always know, but in this context, we really know the, the importance of viruses and their classification. So now we're going to start about uh, like a personal view of virus discovery. So here, for instance, uh, you, uh, you, you, you are going to learn about uh, the mate in, Ar in Argentina. It's a, it's, a, it's a most iconic drink. It's, a, it's from a plant which is native from Northeast Argentina and the South of Brazil and Paraguay. Uh, it, it is cultivated there in, the, in, the, in this, its place of emergency. Argentina uh, generates 90% of its productions. Almost 95% of Argentinians drink mate every day. So it's like we drink coffee, but mate is even uh, like more prevalent uh, here. Uh, um, so uh, like 10 years ago, we were working about trying to understand the genes of, of this uh, crop because, well, we didn't know a thing about it. Uh, so we generally like a catalog of, 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 of all the genes of, of these plants. And, and there, I, I, uh, to, to do this, we try to, to, I'm going to tell you a little bit later how we read the genes, but it's basically we extract the nucleic acids of, of these organisms and try to read all the nucleic acids that are there, and then we try to organize them. So after doing that, we generated a, a, like a catalog, and we, saw, and we um, published that there were around 13,000 uh, genes uh, doing different stuff for, for this plant. Um, uh, and there I have uh, one idea which is so obvious today, but it was not that obvious 10 years ago, that says, so uh, if we are reading all these nucleic acid of the, the genes of the plant, maybe there I can read the nucleic acid of some virus of this plant. So there we go, <coughs> and we describe it, <coughs> sorry, uh, like uh, the first virus associated to this plant. Now we know about five or six of them that we have classified and they could have an impact. So during that year, I was just looking around and I saw the, 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 this uh, paper about the uh, rabbit genome and, and its analysis. Uh, so I tried to replicate what, we ha we, wh what I did with the data from the yerba mate. And what, I, and what I found was interesting because even the scientists who, who described this genome didn't know in one of the samples of the liver of one of the rabbits they used to generate this genome, there was a hepatitis E virus. So uh, even though the, the scientists were trying to explain what the rabbit genome was, etc., there was also a virus there. So well, uh, uh, we, from that point of view, <clears throat> we managed to start like a kind of, of cycle of 
various discovery based in studies that are trying to introduce gen a genetic data of organisms, and they have ne uh, and din they didn't look for viruses. It's not uh, very difficult, but it's just you have to look for them to find them. Uh, so, well, well uh, eventually, a few years uh, after, they found that, that rabbits don't, not only uh, uh, can be infected by this virus, but they can also share it so, uh, and could be a vector of this virus. So it, was, it has relevance. Uh, so uh, again, how we, how, we, how we do this? Uh, we, we try to extract the nucleic acid from this, and we put uh, that to generate uh, libraries, and then we introduce to do this large equipment that can read all that data, and then we process in, in computer to try to find signatures with specific that has to do with genes that do things, etc. In the case of viruses, there are also signatures about that that can tell us a little bit about what they do, what they don't do. Uh, after that, there is a different pipelines to process this. They are most basically trying to align or overlap those uh, reads because these are short reads of, 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 of nucleic acids. And then if you overlap then you can get a longer read and then you can understand what they're trying to say. I'm going to try to do, to generate this protein or this structural protein or this functional protein, etc. So what about the availability of data uh, of that kind of runs that, uh, of libraries of sequencing data? Well, it replicates almost everything in science that is in the global north, there is a lot of more publicly available data from organisms that uh, also the map is not uh, like the geography. The map represents a biased view of what has been sequenced in the world. So, and the, uh, and, and the current data is around 30 petabases, which I, it says 30 million gigabases. I guess it's a lot, maybe not for you, but, uh, uh, but it's a very large number of, of nucleic, nucleic acids data in uh, publicly available to analyze. So how do you analyze? Well, there are important infrastructure, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there uh, below you can see a representation of my infrastructure for virus discovery. So I try to use a, a resource which are available in the, in the cloud and they're wonderful resource and people who have worked a lot to try to provide this tool and democratize the analysis of large data even for scientists who cannot uh, buy uh, those and uh, maintain all that large extent. Some of them are the, this uh, platform uh, called Use Galaxy, which can analyze a, a, a very big amount of data using only, uh, mm, without paying for, for, for using it, etc. It has been used a lot for SARS-CoV virus discovery, etc. So I thought there was this big, huge uh, um, uh, machines that can read the uh, nucleic acid, but very recently they developed a very small one. That's uh, uh, that, uh, this one that is called a Manion. It's a technology from, from the UK, and it can do almost the same stuff that the big machines can do, and that also introduces a lot of, of democratizing of, of, of the sequencing infrastructure. That is, uh, the, the, that equipment costs around uh, $1,000 and it's ready to work. So uh, uh, even us could buy that kind of stuff and start uh, uh, sequencing our own stuff. The, the nature of this is fantastic how they develop this platform. Maybe in the question I could provide some clues. They are also developing some smaller one. And here in the picture, you can see me with a pipette, which isn't something that I don't usually do, but we, uh, we did some of that on during the pandemic. They have used this uh, equipment even to uh, sequence things in the International Space Station. So it's not only democratizing in terms of uh, uh, price, but also in portability. So you can go and sequence what you understand. For instance, these guys took it to the Amazon forest and saw a, a frog, and they took a sample of the frog, and they identified, based on the nucleic acid, which frog it was. Related to this, we uh, in a study of our colleagues from uh, from Georgia University, we find that this American green tree frog, they were studying genes of sex, etc. This is one of our examples. And we find a virus. And this virus was related to rabies. Uh, so this was the first report of some rabies-like virus in an amphibian. And we, we, uh, we were a little uh, scared about that, so uh, the, the people in Georgia started working in a different manner with these frogs. <laughs> there, there, there was something very cute, and now there could be very something dangerous. We're still working with that. Eventually, uh, we, we did something very uh, similar with hepatitis in a frog from the Tibet, which we published a few years ago. And, and now, then, that we're going to get 
So the, some other examples, for, for instance, you know, you really know Misles is one of the most contagious virus there is. Um, uh, uh, it's a morbidly virus that's a kind of virus that, uh, that infects human. And for instance, if you are infected and there are 10 susceptible people are around you, nine of them will get infected if they are not vaccinated. So it's incredible. For instance, with COVID, it's around three. This is incredibly more. But of course, since the development of the vaccine, uh, the deaths have uh, uh, stopped a lot all around the world. But in the sub-Saharan region of the world, there are still 140,000 uh, deaths each year of these, mostly with kids uh, below the five years. And that's because uh, the lack of access of the vaccine. Anyway, uh, I, uh, we were looking for the, so we are going to yeah, so, so this last example, but uh, I, I could provide a little bit more, uh, is, is about uh, mice in the south of Argentina and Chile that we found have some viruses that are related to this misless uh, virus. So we're working with that and also from with the bat of the Panama um, with fireflies and, and some other examples. And mosquitoes, because we hate mosquitoes. Well, thank you for your time. In the last uh, slide, I have my contact details and what we do here. In Woo! Thanks so much, Alberto. That's amazing. OK, <laughs> you can take a breath now. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions for Humberto? I can start you off. I was going to ask you, how, how are data analysis techniques changing what you're doing? And then you started talking about the Smidgeon and the Nanan. So maybe I'll ask you, uh, what's next? Like, how's this going to change? Well, uh, well, it, it's it's a great question because I don't know the answer. But uh, I guess, uh, uh, for instance, today they have published a, a, a new pipeline for because when you try to find viruses, you try how do you look look for them? You try to look something which is similar of the ones that you have already uh, known. Uh, so in you know that rabies is a virus. So let's look something that is similar to this. <clears throat> and you have to use thresholds of similarity. Because if your threshold is like too long, then uh, you are going to have false positive, that things that are like are cellular or something, but are not viruses. So uh, there is a lot of advancements in that area in particular, which appears to be simple, but it's not at all. For instance, today they are, of course, using some artificial intelligence uh, algorithm to try to provide a better pipelines for virus discovery. So uh, what I think is that even though there are like large efforts to try to, you, you know, to describe the diversity of virus all around uh, us, uh, there, there, there is a, a need for a lot of work among people to try to not only describe, say, oh, here there are 10,000 new viruses, but try to look at them specifically and look for the possibilities of their eventual emergencies or, or, or pandemic characteristic of the possibility that they could generate a disease. And uh, well, I, I didn't talk about that, but for instance, I work in, a, in an agricultural sector. So uh, we work a lot with viruses that affect crops because as I told you, they affect all the organisms. So you can imagine that in plants, the virus have been even lesser studied at all. So yeah, I think that, that, that what is going to need is a, like a lot of effort, um, maybe better platforms to try to advance in this. Thank you. Any other questions? It could be in Spanish, puede ser en español. No? A pope's got a question. Yeah. Yeah, what are the trade-offs between like a nano small device that and the supercomputer like what are the trade offs in terms of is it in terms of accuracy or just you know it obviously brings more portability like you can take it to a forest but what are the trade offs are that yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, the, those big machines uh, have a better quality in their in their readings. So, uh, uh, but you can compensate that by generating more readings. That is uh, uh, you have as I said before, I'm very bad with numbers. But for example, if you have one read which has a 99% accuracy, which is something all common, 99.9% .9 accuracy in the large equipment, this uh, small one started with an uh, accuracy of about 90%. But if you read something like 20 times, uh, in uh, like in overlapping ways, uh, eventually, you know, nine of those reads are going to say the correct thing. So it's easier, you know, to curate that. So the, the, yeah, you have to generate more data, which is uh, more expensive sometimes, but they are working in the, in the chemistry and they are reaching better quality. So 
all the infrastructure in sequencing is moving more to this portable stuff. They also, they, they, that same company also generates some like, like a table of a lot of man ions together and they can be like similar to the big one, but yeah, it's, it's, it's around there. Okay, we've only got 30 seconds left. You got very quick, one of you two had a question. <laughs> Uh, I'm curious where you get your samples. You have so many diverse uh, sequencing <laughs> projects. Uh, where does like the yerba mate and the frogs and all the different stuff come from? Oh, that's a great, great question because I, I, I didn't explain it at all. I, I mean, some of them, we just sequence them, for instance, the yerba, et cetera. It's like we, we provide, we have partners and they sequence the first stuff. But there is also available a massive uh, our, our amount of libraries, public available for anyone. One of the most important resources at NCVI, it's, a, it's called the Sequence Read Archive. And we as a scientist have to deposit our, our reads there. But again, when we have an objective as like our genes, then there is a lot of data that is unprocessed and uh, so available to, you know, to look for this, this virus. I hear, woo, open data. Is that what you just said? <laughs> yeah, woo -hoo! thank you so much. <laughs>